Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming back in. Thank you for staying through the afternoon. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, uh, the, the demos and the, um, and the expert advice that you've uh, had out in the mainstream. But now you've got to earn your, oh, I was going to say earn your lunch, earn your supper. Um, questions for this uh, terrific panel. Um, at the extreme left hand, we have uh, Jacob, Barf Jacob Barford, then Stephen Old from Dolby Labs, Rob Taylor from LG is there. Yeah, no, sorry, Rob. Uh, Phil Pinney from uh, Crestron and John Thompson from Picture Works. Uh, questions for these guys? Okay, could you introduce yourself for the sake of the microphone, that's all? Sure. Uh, I'm Phil Cotton from Finite Solutions. Phil Cotton, thank you, Phil. Um, when you're streaming 4K content, or when 4K content is streamed, what kind of compression, uh, what, what effect does the compression have on the uh, image and sound quality? What's compression doing um, to streamed content? Anyone want to make a start on that? I, I have my view, but it may disagree with one or two here. <laughs> Maybe it seems like a TV question. <laughs> so I it is a TV. Yeah, it's a TV question. Right. Um, so the main issue with 4K streaming is currently bandwidth in the household. Um, a lot of these services do recommend a minimum bandwidth. So it's not so much more on the device side that creates the initial concern. It's more on the bandwidth and the, the broadband speed in the home. Um, part of our after sales and our customer care is to always speed test and to always ask the customers to speed test their line because more than often it's linked to that. The compression within the TV, as I say, is, is, is adequate enough to carry a less than recommended uh, line speed, but nonetheless, most of our issues are, are linked to line speed in the home. So, yeah. Uh, and what's the recommendation speed? Good, good question. Yeah, what would you say as a minimum? Network provider, I think Netflix 4K is something like 25. So it's already quite, quite, quite a heavy, fast one, um, which obviously is not something that is sort of the average in the UK. In fact, that's limit, that's linked to like fibre speeds, which is still a new service in the UK as well. So, um, but we just try and work with our our, our service providers and our, and our and our content partners to ensure that everything's properly and fairly tested on the TV. But as I say, it's it's often coming back to the line speed in the household. Just to sort of add to that, what happens is it's got the there's the maximum quality and then there's a the variable quality. So what will happen is it'll test the speed and it will find an average quality. And you might actually notice that the picture's not as sharp as you think it is. There's actually nothing wrong with the television or the stream. It's just that actually the bandwidth has limited itself, so it's actually made the picture uh, less in resolution to try and accommodate it. Um, sometimes you'll see if you're watching it, it looks and then suddenly it'll jump. Yeah. And that's, that's when it suddenly it's, it's picked up speed and you've actually got more bandwidth going through it. I mean, 4K uses primarily H.265, which is a lot more agile compression technology than Blu-ray previously and um, streaming, which used H.264. Mm. So no doubt there'll be H.266 at some point as well. Nice. Yeah, our TV support is just yeah, okay. well. 8K. 8K. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much 4K to watch that. Yeah, really we don't need to worry about 8K too much today. <laughs> uh, but that's just a sign of the times and you know resolution and formats and whatnot and HDR and where does it go in terms of format. So LG actually has an 8K device. I don't know if you, for those who are lucky enough to go to CES, you would have seen it on, on the wall there, a 98-inch 8K TV. But commercially, we're not expecting that business to pick up because it's literally just a, a display technology opposed to broadcast technology. So as the broadcasters come on board with uh, additional enhanced resolution, new, new formats will come on board with ways to display it. But, yeah. And who, who mentioned 16K? Well, I you mentioned 27, didn't you? 27K. The, the general consensus, of course, you know, never say never, because these guys will always be looking for the next, uh, uh, the next um, addition to the, uh, to the devices they sell. <coughs> but the general consensus is at about 8K, we needn't go much further. You know, it's, but anyway, 8K is for another day. Um, you'll, find, you'll find high dynamic range is the next big yeah. thing that's going to... And actually, that has a lot more effect than resolution. You could have a 20K image and if it hasn't got the right dynamic range you won't make any difference so you could have a nice 2k with high dynamic range and actually you probably blow quite a lot of your way and you go oh that's unbelievable i was, didn't believe it was that good um the, yeah the the industry advice and it's and it's absolutely spot on it's not so much that we want more pixels yes we do need more pixels but the quality of that pixel yes. has to be better so the 8-bit standard is long now being uh, uh, surpassed uh, we're looking now at you know 10 bits and 12-bit 
bit depth mm -hmm. for the for the quality of that pixel, and that's what gives you that that wider co color gamut. The uh, uh, the higher dynamic range will come, and the uh, 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 as the streaming gets better. As the streaming gets better, of course, you don't get problems with streaming on a satellite, but that's by the by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question for these guys. You just get rain fade. <laughs> no, 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 you get a lot of rain fade. <laughs> it's snowing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, Andrew Deacon. Uh, just a question about 3D in 4K. Um, I've read that it's not compatible, it's not going to be a 3D format 4K. Is that true or is that uh, just the truth? Uh, the question just for the mic is whether there's going to be a 3D version of 4K and what compatibility problems there might be. Thoughts? Well, cinema, in cinema there's a 3D 4K spec, mm. but 3D appears to have died a death, thankfully, because um, it was a pain in the ass and not, always gave me a headache. I mean, I can't think, there's probably one or two films that utilised it very well, but the, if you notice the box office, it's like, what happened to Avatar did phenomenally well. You know, everyone in this, oh, we have to have 3D. And if you notice, it's like this massive nosedive all the way down of, you know, when you get something like The Last Airbender and people are going, how do I get my money back? <laughs> you know, um, it, it, so, uh, with high dynamic range, the, the, the thing, um, our friends here at Dolby do a demo of their Dolby Vision, which, if you look at it, if you get the picture set up right enough, 4K high dynamic range looks, looks 3D. Yeah. The, fa the fact is, of this room, uh, something like 17% of us will not recognize 3D. We have some sort of myopia, some sort of problem with our vision. We, 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 we can't differentiate between red and green. 17%. Well, that's okay when you're, uh, when you're Hollywood and you're appealing to the other 83%, but for broadcast TV, it's a problem. Oh, and Sky announced this week that they're finally And they're closing. Yeah. They're closing. Uh, in fact, I'm surprised they've kept it going so long, to, yeah. be, to be truthful. Uh, you can still download, mm. not on IP, it'll have to be uh, <laughs> some other method. So it's... it's uh, We've uh, gone from that, I must have, to <coughs> other comes with. I'll tell you, oddly enough, who's kept with it and is enthusiastic about it and is still producing in 4K, and that's Sky Italia. They've got something like 10% of their, of their subscriber base paying five euros a month for it. So, mm. you know, horses for courses. Mm. Questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Ivan Ox, I'm freelancer, uh, HTC P2.2. <laughs> And, and, to do to us? and beyond, yeah. <laughs> 20 mil handshakes or whatever it is, yeah. millisecond. HCCP. Probably not work. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably not work, said John. Um, it's you're gonna, it's going to be lots of teething problems to start with. Um, our man down here on the front has already encountered some teething problems with it. Um, it's like all these security protocols, it'll take some time for it to, to bed in. Um, and different manufacturers will have different, until literally a couple of years down the line, it won't um, be a universal standard. Um, that's, that's the problem with it. It's, it's too new. Is it right that it's not backward compatible so that if you put one device in your system, you're, you really need to replace devices down the chain? I, I've never actually tried it that. Would, would I think the problem at the moment is that uh, even manufacturers don't know quite how different combinations of yeah. are going to work. Mm. Ask the hackers. There. Yeah, yes. um, uh, the DTG that has a, a huge testing facility right next door to the uh, Secret Service on the on the South Bank. Uh, digital television group. Uh, they do a plug fest every three months of, of really pushing the envelope on sets and boxes um, and they have nightmare stories to tell you on some products, not, not from LG and not from Samsung, not from Sony, but they really do have some nightmare problems in, in even gathering ordinary stuff over the, over the sky or from a virgin uh, uh, box. Um, Hollywood has always taken a pragmatic view about, about piracy and content protection. Yeah, shoot them all. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, it would love to, but I think some of, they know that it's going to happen. You know, how quickly now in a, in, with, yeah. with well, a 4K display will someone put a camcorder in front of it and, and rip that movie which, off? Which is why Hollywood's going for day and date releases across sure. the, um, the whole world, because that's the only way they can, because yeah. yeah, otherwise you're creating a desire. It's like, well, if, yeah, if the Avengers comes out in America <laughs> and everyone's 
on the net going, oh, the Avengers is great, then literally there'll be a demand for it. I noticed one the other day, I was watching a trailer, I think it was on Apple, Apple TV, and it was, at the end of it, it was the first one I'd seen, which was in cinemas and stream, and then there was a date, and I sat there and went, finally, Mm. Yeah, yeah. Finally, they're starting to realise that this might actually work. I think you're absolutely right. Well, wasn't I think... Russell Brand's film, was it? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, don't, no. I don't see that although, going. Although, quite on, that would have been watched half a million times this morning. Absolutely. Compared to the Conservatives one that had been watched 10,000 times or something stupid like that. I, I think for, uh, for Hollywood uh, to charge you know, a, a sum of money, whether it's you know, five somethings or ten somethings, to see the movie on a TV screen on, on day one of the release, I, I, my view is that it wouldn't damage the cinema revenue at mm -hmm. all. People will still go and see it on a big screen. Well, if we, if we doing big systems for clients, clients want to watch them their own house. Absolutely. Or I mean, places like this, they don't really want to go to the Odeon and that. And have the smell of popcorn. Sorry, Odeon. Yeah, but it's one, one of the proposals that was put forward that uh, um, Jeffrey Katzenberg seemed to be endorsing quite a lot was um, uh, size pricing. So if you watched it on your mobile, it was one price, and if you watched it on a screen that size, it was a different price. So that has, does have some merits, but also has some issues because I can actually take my phone and stream to that screen so it's like I don't, there's lots of ways of like so you're going to see lots of different variables in the next couple of years that that may be a tad high it's a sort of standard definition again yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was well, a question so, over there yeah. somewhere yes sir uh, um, I think you might have been yourself mentioned about um, 4k transmissions by intel sat has anybody no got, not in put their hand up so uh, uh, in it wasn't so much Intelsat. Intelsat would make a 4K contribution of, of a sports event or the Olympics or something. They will, they, that's their speciality, um, a contribution of signals back to the broadcaster. Uh, but it's, it's uh, Astra and Utilsat that have mm. test channels on air now in 4K. Utilsat are live on, on a channel now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Astra, the old Astra position at 19.2 for those of you who go back a little while, and the new, if you like, the newish UK and Ireland position at 28.2, they've all got test channels on air. Uh, but so is Telenor over Scandinavia. I mean, they all recognize that the, the best way of showcasing 4K material to the dealer is actually to put a live stream out. Um, uh, it's, uh, and they're free to air, and they're free, absolutely free. And if you've got an H, um, uh, uh, an H two six five, if you've got an HEVC yeah. uh, decoder in the box, in the in, in, in the, the set, case, yeah. which you have, then it's it's plug and play. It's really very simple. Um, tell me, guys. Let me go up and down the panel. Uh, we've talked about 4K and ultra high def. Um, there's about 25 or 30 different brand styles for 4K, 4K ultra, you know, the, the latest 4K, 4K ready. Is this confusing the consumer? Um, uh, Jakob, let me start with you. It always confuses the consumer, but this is what you get with different manufacturers. Different manufacturers will never follow the same standard. You, you, I'll bet you could put all the movie the movie producers in the same room you can put all the manufacturers in the same room I bet you put all our engineers in the same room <laughs> I would bet they would never agree so you're always going to have this you're going to try and see how we can position we will try and position our messaging in the best possible way but I don't think that our way is what everybody else thinks so unfortunately I think that's just that's, just that's part of the marketing part of the marketing, part marketing challenge marketing. yeah if, if everybody says this is the way you know, that's so I can I can now tear up the letters I get about once a month from the European Broadcasting Union. Dear Chris, please stop referring to 4K with a capital K. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lowercase K. <laughs> I really do. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Thousands per year. So uh, so it's it, we're going to have to live with it until things settle down. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> Other questions? I'm going to go back to my crib. <coughs> I, mean, I suppose I've got one. Um, Sony, um, I mean, I'm impressed with just the, the ranges you were showing today, but you know, we do deal a lot with Sony, and um, you're constantly hearing every day that Sony are backing away from the consumer market, the TV market, the projection market. You know, is that a hearsay, or are Sony still focused on their growth going forward in the, the consumer market? Well, I will I'll take specific on the projector market. I would just 
see which other manufacturer and in the last three years launched new 4K projectors, a laser projector, or all the time coming with new products in the last three years. And if you count the number of new products that's come by each of the um, each of the manufacturers, I think actually we stand out mm. with actually having the <clears throat> having the most amount of new products. So that's it. I think it's what you say contradicts what other people say, but you get it from a third party, so well, you never know what's true. And the last thing we want to do is be specking, you know, high-end projectors into people's properties, you know, and then there's issues with them down the line which we can't get sorted. But no, uh, well, I would say on high-end projection with 4K laser SXRD, yes, Sony is here to stay. This is a core cool technology from Sony, so and also you'll see. In a couple of months, you also see that that's actually the case mm. in terms of new products. Um, question for Stephen from me, mm. uh, and then we can expand it down up and down the line. Uh, we've heard a huge amount just a second ago, high dynamic range, wider color gamut, uh, improved frame rates, um, the wow factor. Uh, does the buyer out there, does the viewer care about... Well, I, I think so, yeah. I mean, um, I just got back from NAB and we, where we had the, the, the uh, Vizio displays with Dolby Vision. Is that okay? Um, and uh, I think the, the difference is, you know, really noticeable, you know, as, as you were describing from comparing standard 4K with HD, you know, we had HD and 4K um, displays with, with high dynamic range, the Dolby Vision, I think it is it's very compelling, you know, that, that's an experience people haven't really really seen before I, I think um, when you do see, you see it, it it's, it's pretty, pretty obvious it's quite dramatic um, so yeah I think generally yes I think the consumer will recognize the difference yeah. uh, Jakob well I, I think it, it relates to what John said on, on in terms of the 3d as well because one mm. of the things is okay I can see 3d it doesn't appeal to me very much as a person so this is my personal thing but when you see 4k and high dynamic range then you can really see a difference in depth on the picture and that's where I see it coming mm -hmm. you know, Rob, so, yeah. yeah I'd like to add to that in the sense that it seems like there's an overall device trend where picture quality has become more important than ever mm -hmm. um, particularly within the TV world the consumer TV world the products got smarter they got better design they got thinner but since when, really, in the last five years, have we talked about the prime principle of picture quality? And I think over the last 18 months, it has been more about picture quality than ever. Um, hence why LG is sort of invested into OLED technology, and I 100% agree with, with my peers here, that you know, HDR and 4K really does create that stop and stare moment, whereas maybe 3D didn't, because you'd have to experience it with the glasses on. Yeah. And uh, maybe smart TV takes a little bit longer, and if you're in a store, do they have Wi-Fi? Is it connected? What the hell am I doing? You know. Whereas when you see in a store environment or in a person's home, stunning picture quality, great, uh, great wider color gamut, and better luminance through HDR, it really does actually create that wow moment. So now more than ever, because it's back to the picture quality, back e to the basics. Excellent. Mm -hmm. and Excuse me, can I add something? Yeah, with pleasure. Um, I, 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 in a different position than you guys, but I'm, I'm in, you know, designing and installing these systems. Uh, my um, seal of approval, if you like, if I've done a, a good job, is how much people are using the systems. And obviously in a projector you've got a, a, a clock, you can see how many hours it's been used for. And typically it's between three and four hours a day is, is what it's used for if you go back a year, 18 months later. <coughs> that's what we see with the 4K projectors we put in. So I don't, you know, but people are using it as a TV. Uh, the whole family are using it, they're using it every day. We work for some, for some very, very wealthy people that you would think were away the whole time, and they're absolutely loving it. So, uh, as far as I'm concerned, people are voting when they're free. If they, if they see it demonstrated correctly in a good environment, there's absolutely no one is under any doubt that it's better than they want it. No, is, is, is now the right time to be, to be um, uh, putting in this new kit? What about the kit you might have put in six and 12 months ago? Uh, uh, how future proof is today's future? Um, well, I, I, you know, uh, again, uh, I'm um, not the most subtle individual. <laughs> and, uh, um, I think it's very simple. For you know, you've got a smaller dot, you can make a better picture, and it's better with existing content. I think it's so simple and black and white. We're not putting in 4K, saying in, in you know when there's 4K content, your picture will be better. We're showing them 4K and we show them 1080p, and they say, oh, I can see detail yeah. there; it looks better. Yeah. So it's exactly the same with Atmos. This is the whole excitement with the whole thing for me as a business. It's been fantastic in the last six months. You show people. You say, well, what's your favourite film? Not, I'm going to play your dem disc. Let's let's watch Blade Runner. Let's watch Apocalypse Now. Let's watch Zulu. Zulu in 4K. <laughs> it's, it's it's 
don't tell me you ever saw it that way at the cinema. Yeah. It looks better than it ever did at yeah. the cinema. So you're going back and seeing, for me, that film's 50 years old. I was too young to see it at that time. It's, I've never seen it look that good, yeah. and I'm sure no one ever has. <laughs> and that's the thing. It makes, but you see it, and you cannot help but help get excited by the audio quality and the picture quality. Um, we just need to demonstrate it better and, to, and get it out to more people. Uh, 4K uh, in the home as well as, uh, 4, I mean, high-end 4K installations. Um, to what extent do you have to plan in the, uh, the, the challenges of connectivity for today and maybe uh, uh, future developments? Um, uh, well, I'm a Luddite. You want to speak to someone that understands these things. Um, I say you need broadband there, uh, and then hope it will go away. Um, I, I, you know, who knows what's what's happening with streaming, etc. Um, I, um, I'm a, te a technophobe. I hate the stuff, but I like better picture and better pe better sound quality. And if whenever we put a system in, we give the, the client half a dozen really good Blu-rays, and then we know that's the standard. That, that they know that's what the system can do. Um, and when more content comes on stream, I mean, I, you know everyone's very aware. Clients are very aware these days, aren't they, of, of, of yeah. Netflix and 4K, etc., etc. So um, as, as far as I'm concerned, they get what they're buying now is much much better, and it's only going to get better as, as more content comes along. Uh, Rob the same sort of yeah, question to you. Definitely, I think um, you know it's part of the almost like the manufacturers and the brand's responsibility to tell people that there's content because we're selling the device ahead of the content. So it's kind of we're leading the way in that sense. And um, that's why these brand partnerships are really important. I mean, for those that have been watching LG over the last couple of years, you'd seen that we work quite closely with Netflix. And um, their production of 4K was champion on LG devices. Uh, locally, we do promotions with Netflix to put 4K content in people's hands, you know, at point of purchase. Uh, we work with the likes of Amazon, who are also producing 4K content. Our TVs uh, carry the correct codec for YouTube 4K content, so users can generate their own and put them on the TV. So it's partly our responsibility to say, hey, this TV will work with the 4K content, however it's served. Um, but Therein lies another problem. We have to obviously work with the service providers as well to actually convince them that, hey, you need to commercialise and make this more popular because we can only do so much. You know, we're usually, you know, the, the last point of the consideration purchase is which TV do I buy? Not, I want to see 4K and therefore I'll choose this LG TV. Sure. So we have to work together and I think that's over the last couple of years what we've been quite, quite keen to do. And I think principally it will be served via IPTV. Um, you know, you've seen that with Netflix and, and Amazon, which are kind of the, the lead services that way. But the broadcasters will be very close behind them. I think it's quite public knowledge about BT's ambitions around 4K. Exactly. Uh, and that will be, that'll be an IPTV solution as well. Um, obviously linked to their fibre speeds and fibre optic packages, so it's all available, the infrastructure is there to support. Um, it's just the big guys in Osterley, you know, what do, they, what, do they, what do those guys want to do? So, you know, you, you speak to them, they tell you one thing, but do you accept that answer? I don't think so. Um, <laughs> I've, I've never seen Sky lose product leadership before, and yeah. I don't expect them to lose product leadership now. So I, I, I don't, I don't know officially. I can't say anything. But me as a tech fan, as a you know, as a TV enthusiast, I'm hoping that they too come to the party because yeah. then it will be more content for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Stephen, you've not been here during the day, so you haven't heard all of the praise that Dolby has received <laughs> during the oh, day. Oh, good. Yeah. Let's recap. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, job safer today. That's it's, right. it's a very, it's a very genuine sentiment from everyone here. No, but. Um, you're also very active in, if you like, 4K workflow solutions. Mm. You've got your own ideas as to how standards might evolve, building yeah. on today's standards. Yeah. Uh, give us an insight. Where do you think we are, as far as Dolby is concerned, yeah. in that area? I mean, we, we approach the whole sort of video workflow like with audio. So, you know, exactly like Rob was just saying with the um, content creation, it's really important, you know, we can innovate and have great playback solutions, whether it's with Dolby Atmos you know, home playback systems or, you know, um, high dynamic range displays and things, but you need to get the, the content producers enthused, yeah. they need to understand, you know, the benefit the market, um, yeah. in creating content in these formats and then, you know, where we sort of fit in is is trying to um, you know, make it practical. So working with, you know, people who um, are either sort of grading in high dyna dynamic range, um, creating uh, Dolby Atmos um, sound mixes and how you get that through content workflows. You know, cinema workflow is one thing, but when you start looking at 
uh, either streaming or broadcast. It's you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of challenges there, and you know that, that's why you know we work with lots of different partners across this and these entire sort of content creation and distribution workflows to try and you know sort of bridge some of those gaps between the, the content <coughs> creators and ultimately you know the playback systems in in people's homes. And and uh, to what extent do you do you sense the industry is listening to to your arguments? I think you know broadly um, uh, we're not sort of coming at this completely new. So I think you know yeah. a, a forty plus year history in in, in cinema um, with surround sound over twenty years now, pretty much in, in, in the home. Um, and I think when we look at what we're trying to do in in the video space and, and improving that, um, you know we, we have a. Um, you know some announcements with people like Warner and, and Voodoo. So again, going back to that that, that sort of streaming side of things, um, that I think that the streaming partners are now seeing that it is actually possible to you know quite easily integrate um, uh, systems and, and and workflows that work with things like high dynamic range and 4K uh, video distribution in, into into the home. So I think we're seeing some, some you know good traction now. Um, let me come uh, down to Phil. Um, Oh, you've got a mic. I, I can even stand in front of you. Uh, Phil, um, back in the old days, you know, I'd put a VHS in the slot, um, and it would start playing instantly. Then, uh, of course, DVD came along, and it took, I don't know, uh, 10 or 20 or 30 seconds to start playing. And then I'd put a Blu-ray in uh, more recently, and I tend to go and have a shower then while it's uh, while it's. That's just the adverts. <laughs> That's also true. I could do without those. Um, uh, there's some anxiety that um, that Blu-ray, 4K, 4K Blu-ray might be taking well, you know, more than 10 and 20 seconds to load up. What what do you sense is going to happen in that area? Uh, personally, I think it, again it's back to that bandwidth discussion. Um, I don't believe it will make disc-based content. Um, I think it will just skip that altogether and go down the streaming route. Which oh, then, really? what well, again, personal opinion, but I think. From what they tried to fit on a Blu-ray, and when 3D came in, and they were, you know, halfway through um, changing a disc, I can't see with the bandwidth kind of uh, demands that 4K is going to have that it would feasibly fit on a disc. Um, and I just think that the, as the guys were saying earlier on, with things going into cinema at the same time and now being streamed simultaneously, it's quicker. It's getting it out to market faster. So why would you put something on disc-based content that's still got the not the opportunity to copy, I don't think that's going to be the, the plug behind it, but I just think it's it's getting that content now. You can release something at midnight in the US and it's six o'clock in the morning here and it's it's the same launch at the but, same time. But just to be devil's advocate here, um, you know, my <laughs> now 42-year-old son has only about, you know, 42 different versions of Star Wars, you know, from four to widescreen to special edition, uh, you know, VHS. He's whatever <coughs> issue was put out, he's bought. And this, I know the the package market is declining, but there are still a lot of people out there who like to own their content. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'd agree. You know, I, I miss the times of going to a Woolworths, believe it or not, to go and buy a, a CD <laughs> or a Now mixtape when I saved up a bit of money. But it was quite nice to go home with your cassette and then yeah. you know, make copies for your friends. Um, but I think... You know, <laughs> so it's all your fault. <laughs> He's killed. First of all, he's killed the music industry. He's killed the music. <laughs> now he's going to kill the. I took Woolworths down just one hand at a time, my, my local store. But what I'm saying about that is, I think you're totally right. Um, but HMV seems to go through shifts, just to use them as one yeah. example. Um, and I think there was a, a provider recently, uh, I think it's Sky, my parents go online, buy a movie, and then they get sent a disc. I don't understand that. But again, there's no way of being able to store that content on Sky per se, so maybe that the fact that that playback then is instant in the fact that you've got the physical disc or as you said people want that content. If you're buying that limited edition kind of mm -hmm. Star Wars 15 seconds of extra cut <laughs> unseen before and it's the Wookiee in the woods kept, then maybe you want that kept, on disc. Kept, kept Hollywood alive. Kept like Hollywood alive. Just, it's, just also, it's also interesting because broadband speeds, you know I deal with clients who live, who've got houses in the middle of nowhere you know, and they're getting less than one meg broadband speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they can't even download HD, mm -hmm. let alone 4K. Yeah. So we're yeah. going to have to still have some sort of form of optical media. I mean, if you look at the physical media business, it's actually stabilised. It was last month that HMV overtook Amazon as the largest supplier of physical media in the UK. Suddenly HMV have gone back up back again. Up again. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's quite clever. The one, the one on um, Oxford Street opens at 8am in the morning, so you can, you know... It's, it's packed as well. Yeah, it's packed. Um, so, I mean, I don't think Blu-ray is going to go away. I think it's going to be, always be a market there for physical discs. I mean, 
I'll make a prediction this time, you know, CES next year, I can guarantee you, Sony Stand will have Spectre running on a HD Blu-ray, <laughs> LG will probably have Mission Impossible 5 running, and then Star Wars Episode 7 will probably be on somebody, yeah, all, and those will be the wow factors that will help 4K go into the next thing, because it would be like, oh, God, if you want to watch Star Wars Episode 7, you've got to see it in 4K. And that, yeah, if they've got any sense, they'll, if you notice now, DVDs that come out actually have no extra features on them. Blu-ray is the only ones with extra features on, so I'm sure something it'll migrate like that, and it'll be like, oh, if you want the the version, you have to get it on Ultra HD. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, just to add to that as well, if you take learnings from other industries, it's it's linked to ours, but not the same. Gaming industry, so that's a massive industry bigger than Hollywood. Yeah. But at the same time, now only hero titles are released on disc. Mm -hmm. Add-ons, you know, additional levels, True. additional characters, yeah. they're all available through the ecosystem that. Xbox or Sony provide so I think maybe physical media will go down that route that you know only certain hit titles are available and they're bought as part of a package where hit title on disc gets you access to all of the ex extras on a website where you can download and watch additional content so it's just about how it gets wrapped up and served to the consumer because there is a space for physical media there always will be because of legacy market um, it's too big for a, a manufacturer, I think Sony would agree. Legacy market is too important to, to, to walk away from. Um, and at the same time, exactly to your point, not everyone can receive 25 MPBS well, down the line. Also about the Dolby so. as well. I mean, what's Dolby's stance on, you know, Atmos enabled downloads? Because mm. obviously it's always that if you want the best quality sound, the best quality picture, you buy the disc. Yeah, yeah. And well, I mean, we, um, so we have like the, the Dolby Atmos True HD solution on Blu-ray, but um, we also kind of uh, re-engineered Dolby Digital Plus for streaming. So it is more efficient, it's lower data rate. Um, and, uh, you know, so for us, it's about being able to deliver that, that Dolby Atmos sort of immersive experience, regardless of whether you're going streaming or, or Blu-ray. But it's a similar thing. Yeah. Not everybody will have huge pipes of broadband going sure. into their home, sure. but they can still get a good experience, you know, but you just need to sort of tailor a little bit how that's delivered. Um, and and uh, let's not ignore, I mean, we, we've tended to focus on, on movies and uh, regular broadcasting, but don't ignore the, if you like, the niches, the very important niches, music, classical music, uh, uh, ballet, opera, you're showing uh, that terrific thing from La Boheme yeah. uh, on your screen, which was shot last... Uh, exactly. Um, but it was, it was shot uh, last summer uh, to celebrate the, um, uh, the Puccini uh, 100 years since his birth or death or whatever. Um, and, uh, and a stunning production, which was done for Rai uh, in Italy. Um, and, it's, and because of the quality of that, they've now commissioned three more operas this year. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means in terms of packaged media when, when Blu-ray th uh, 4K comes out, I have no idea. But, but those niches, whether it's pop music or, or, or obscure foreign films, people, yeah. people are buying that content. Yeah. I mean, in the other side of our business, the audio side of our business, we, we see that now with high definition, high res audio. Yeah. So actually, you know, streaming services are increasingly more popular. Spotify, Napster, Deezer, you know, all these types of great services. You know, but nobody's really championing high resolution audio, um, mainly because devices can't play it back. Sure. Uh, but obviously, LG devices now and, and our multi solutions can. But obviously you can't then communicate high res via Bluetooth and then there's an issue there. So it's also an issue on the audio side as well about how do you create more content in high res, not only video, but also audio, which is, I guess, what the guys here at Dolby are working on as well. When, so did, when did you and I go across to Dolby to hear Dolby's you, Many you, years were in the, yeah. you were still in the pram. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, all those years ago. It was I, a year or two ago. I, I have a question for Steve. Uh, I just wonder uh, what's next for Dolby Atmos in a few months? We'll be one year into the consumer yeah. product, and Good I'm question. sure you must have more to yeah. tell. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we've seen, um, was it released for the home about nine months ago, I guess. So, you know, obviously home theatre is a, is a key thing for us uh, and working on the Dolby Atmos enabled speakers, trying to make that a bit more of a mass market proposition. So, you know, for people who maybe can't go whole hog with, with the in-ceiling speakers. But, um, you know, we, we did re uh, announce, I think it was at Mobile World Congress, some partnerships as well on the mobile side. So, you know, there's huge kind of capabilities now becoming available on, on portable devices to 
to improve you know both image and and, and the, the sound especially over headphones um so with lenovo and also amazon um you know i, I think we'll see you know a bit more uh, in that regard you know being able to improve and create a, a much more immersive kind of sound experience on, on portable devices as well as you know, in your home environment um, but, but can we expect mm. any broadcasters to adopt object-based audio it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't think we could say today at this point, broadcasters, yes. Um, however, I think that, you know, when you look at the types of content that we're working on, certainly theatrical and Hollywood content is clear and we have, you know, kind of three plus year uh, history there. Um, but, you know, when we start looking at other types of content, alternative content, so things like episodic uh, content lends itself, you know, sure. very well to, to things like immersive and three-dimensional Dolby Atmos type uh, sound. Um, and also some of the things you were talking about as well, so for things like concerts and music. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, certainly that there's definitely scope and, and, you know, those discussions uh, happening, but, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to say at this point. Yeah, this, this broadcast is going to be, you know, it's pumping a, out Atmos. A certain broadcaster in, in, at uh, Austin has signed up. No. <laughs> Quick question on audio formats. Please, Regarding go ahead. Regarding and their uh, friends at DTS, where do you think that audio format's going to go when the producers, when they put it out mainstream? Good question. Sorry, close your ears, Dolby. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, but for us, you know, we've, we've been, you know, spending an, an awful lot of time and a lot of investment in the content creation side of things. So that, that's been the key thing. You need to get people and enabled and creating content, you know, in whatever, you know, some three-dimensional type immersive format. Um, and, and I think, you know, our approach with that is working all the way from the creators, which, yes, at this point is very much that, that cinematic theatrical content um, and enabling a better experience in the cinema. Um, and then how we transition that through um, other, you know, distribution pipes into the home. Uh, that's really our kind of value add is, is sort of bridging all of those gaps. You know, I think other other vendors uh, maybe don't have that same approach. Uh, and I, I, you know, so I think from our side, I think we've we've had the right strategy there. Um, Where do you think it will go? Where do you think the producer will take it down the DCS route or? If you, well, you, you, you but, I presume you're saying because like majority of Blu-rays have got DTS Master Audio discs on them. The, the reason being is because Dolby unfortunately dropped the ball with the SDK, which is why you see this proliferation of DTS Master Audio because they they got it right from day one. Um, it's yeah, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the DTS version of it because there is no history of it in the cinema. I mean, you can actually transition. It, it, the clever thing is, you can actually play back Atmos-based stuff. You can actually force it through the DTS uh, algorithm. Um, I don't know what it sounds like, but you can actually force it through that, um, which is one of their USPs. Is that it'll take anything and play anything back. Um, I don't know. I mean, D D D D DTS of. A strange company. They've, they've. One minute they're doing one thing, one minute they're doing something else. Yeah. Then they change their name to DataSat. Then they start producing. You know. Uh, at least D T Dolby are consistent. You know what they're doing. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think on that same line, what happened with THX? You don't see that at all now. Whereas that was. Th THX. I, what, 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 right. THX was sold off to Creative Labs. Uh, a proportion of it. Um, George carried on holding some of the shares in it. It wasn't actually part of the deal with Disney when they bought into Lucasfilm. It was actually a separate entity. Um, it's still going. There are still THX installations. There's still, uh, it, it, you know, there's still amplifiers coming out with THX on it. Seem to see any soundtracks? Um, that's of the well. That, that you mean the taps? Yeah. Were you talking about the tap service they used to do? They used to do a thing called Theatre Alignment Program, which was part of the THX. That, unless, you know, Spielberg, very big directors used to buy any, obviously, because you'd have to pay THX X amount of money. And I think now, though, with digital cinema, it, there's a lot more ability to be able to line it up a lot easier. You, you know, it, it's one of those things that cinemas now are doing a lot better than they were. I mean, back in the day, there was like three sound systems. There was SDDS, DTS, and Dolby. Now, there's something like about 90 different proprietary formats in every single, you go to the View Cinema, they've got their version, you go to Odeon, they've got Odeon Digital Sound, and they're all doing this in the same way that THX did. So THX really sort of became slightly obsolete in that format. Good question though. Uh, any other questions? Well, I've got to go up and down the panel.
and I'm going to ask you two questions. <laughs> How many 4K channels will there be on air <coughs> by, I was going to say December this year. Let's make it easy. December next year. Four? In the UK. In the UK, probably yeah. four. How many would you like to see? 44, yeah. Yeah, well, it was, it's, like, it's like, how long did it take for HD? I mean, you know, it's only now you're seeing news channels in HD, you're seeing all the other, sure. you know, and it's taken them a long time to figure that one out and then move forward. You've got to change all the, you know, you've got different camera equipment. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, it's only now that people have moved, as somebody pointed out earlier, with the broadcast truck from standard def to HD. So people tend to sweat those assets for as long as they can. You know, is 4K horse racing going to be any better than HD horse racing? Because yes. it's obviously just moved to HD. Probably not. And will the consumer, despite the, you know, the high-end installs that you guys are putting in, <coughs> will the consumer actually find the HD signal or the 4K signal? Yeah. Will, still be, will the consumer still be looking at it in, uh, in standard def? Mm -hmm. Phil? Uh, physical broadcast channels, like I said, probably half a dozen. Um, I think the main ones that are going to do it is going to be kind of movies, so you'd probably get a Sky One movies yeah. that you know copies the HD stuff and shows a normal broadcast film in high definition, um, and probably sports, Formula One, golf, that kind of thing. Things that they're going to people are going to find interesting. Absolutely. Quickly. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Rob. The first thing is the first question is really how can they commercialise it? Yeah. That's the big thing. So, so how, TV can, is the how can they monetize? Yeah. Uh, so hence why you'll probably see terrestrial free to air probably last. Um, in my personal view, you I agree, sports, movies uh, will be the first two. Yeah. You'll see bit probably, of discovery, but in that a bit of natural history sort it, of it won't yeah. mimic the full HD channels because yeah. the infrastructure is that much more costly mm. than that of HD. HD infrastructure actually didn't need much investment. It was more on the source side. Yeah. Uh, whereas on the 4K distribution side, there's that's where the big investment is, is distribution. So I'm expecting to see probably from a major satellite provider a handful of channels, probably five, one per genre, from a rival, probably again two to three, one per genre, and then every major IP TV will have an Originals platform, sure. is my view. Originals, obviously, a pet name for yeah. Netflix, but the <laughs> competitors. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I definitely know is the truth. Um, I mean, that all sounds, you know, reasonable as far as, like, you know, I'm concerned. Um, you know, probably I'm bound to say it, but I would very much like to see an HDR proposition as part of, um, you know, some next generation uh, broadcast content. I think that would be great. Um, you know, whether that is 4K or not, it, yeah, certainly 4K is fine. Be, yeah. um, but, you know, that, that would be what I'd like to see. But yeah, I mean, certainly in terms of, you know, the broadcast infrastructure, it's not necessarily going to be facile. And, you know, there are uh, the, the, the issues in terms of commercialization, it's big investment, how, you know, how they're going to get that back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very much in, in line with Rob, but I think we also see some events, like for example on, on Saturday there's going to be boxing, mm. most likely events like boxing would probably be on that, and there might be other events like uh, big concerts, other things that we're trying to commercialise, actually sure. events into 4K as yeah. well, mm. I think that will also drive some of it. I think 4K is perfect for, for, for those big event moments, yeah. and whether it's a golf or whether it's a, a Wednesday night soccer match, uh, uh, it's important, yeah. or likely to be important. Yeah. They all sound smarter and better informed than me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, uh, Rob, yeah, he's, I think I'd, I'd put my money on whatever he says. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and I just want um, 4K on Blu ray, please. Because okay. I like that physical thing. Yeah. yeah, physical that, film. yeah. That'll, be yeah. that'll be September. That'll yeah. be September. September, yeah. <laughs> Certainly fourth quarter, I think. And some Atmos content, please. <laughs> yeah. surely, surely nothing's going to happen until Sky get involved with sport. That's the biggest thing. It's, it's important. This weekend, we'll see the biggest thing ever for pay TV, world TV. That one boxing match is massive. I've not stopped getting phone calls about it for the last three weeks. Mm. And it's going to be murder for me at the weekend. Who's, but, but who's carrying it in the US? This HBO. is the HBO. So it's $90 in standard and $100 in HD. Now, they may capture it in 4K, but they won't transmit it in 4K. No. Mm -hmm. It'll be it'll be high def at best. But, but you're right. Sp sport, sport is, though, the if you look at Sky, Sky, Sky Movies, 
Sky, they, I just, unfortunately, are just fillers. Sky Sport is actually where the money is. That's what I'm saying. They will, they will actually give you the movie package if you take the, yeah. Until Sky do Sky yeah. Sports in 4K. Once that happens, the floodgates will open and everyone will start getting orders and the diaries will be full up with people putting in 4K systems. But until Sky Sports starts mm. 4K, we'll still be talking. The 80-20 rule, we're 20% know about it. When Sky goes, 80% will know about it. Let me, uh, let me follow that up with a statement made by a guy called Phil Goswitz, who's uh, head of broadcasting at DirecTV. Now, they're already streaming, and they're about to start broadcasting. Mm. And I posed the question to him, a bit like this one. I said, you know, how many channels will you have in 2020? You know, five years away on DirecTV. Or how many 4K channels will you have? And he said, well, he said, you've got to remember the three key elements on our broadcast platform. Uh, top of the list is definitely sport. Then there's sport. Then there's sport. He said, however, I confidently expect to see 50 to 60 4K channels on air by 2020. He's on the record. Uh, I don't see Sky. One, no, a lot of those will be movie, um, near video on demand uh, uh, channels. Yeah, but I don't see that being far wrong. Syndicated content as well. Yeah, so sure. The likes of Sky Atlantic is effectively syndicated content. Absolutely. From HBO. It's, it's not. Mm. Uh, gentlemen, I've been given the instructions to wrap up. Um, we could have chatted a little, little longer. But can I, th on behalf of the audience, thank every one of you for your contribution today? You've all, you know, you've opened our ears, you've opened our eyes, you've, uh, your advice has been really, really appreciated. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, I must tell you. Yep, you're all invited to the pub. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks for watching our video. Click below to subscribe and be sure to follow Inside CI on Twitter, Facebook, and Google.